Hello and welcome to the Sandeep Roy show on Express Audio. The Sandeep Roy show. Earlier this year in a horrific incident, a 2-year-old girl was allegedly mauled to death by street dogs in New Delhi's Tughlaq Lane. The National Human Rights Commission took suomo to cognizance of the media reports and directed civic authorities to take preventive and curative action to control the population of stray dogs. But now, some animal welfare organizations say there's no proof that street dogs were the culprit. They are asking CCTV footage to be scanned to investigate the whereabouts of the family's pit bull, which was kept for breeding purposes. All this to say that whenever the issue of any problem involving street dogs comes up in the media, the debate gets quickly polarized and very heated. Some people think those who go around feeding stray dogs are angels and good Samaritans. Others think they are responsible for exacerbating the problems. But what's undisputed is whether you like dogs or not, they are a huge part of the indian landscape whether in cities small towns or villages abiti vanak is an ecologist and director of the center for policy design at the ashoka trust for research in ecology and the environment and has been writing and speaking about this issue for a long time he joins us on the show abiti vanak welcome to the show thank you it's a pleasure to be here You know every time there is a video of someone who has been mauled by dogs on the streets and it appears on social media there's a furor and it mostly pits dog feeders against those who want dogs off their streets and it's very polarized so i wanted to start with some basic facts which is do we actually maintain records on dog bites whereby we could say whether the numbers are increasing or not Um so yes we do maintain records of dog bites dog bite data are supposed to be recorded as part of the national uh, disease surveillance program but until recently rabies itself was not notifiable that the dog bite data were recorded uh, however there's still a gap because only people who go to public hospitals those data used to be recorded a lot of people don't they might go to a private clinic you know to get the anti rabies vaccination so those data uh, were generally not recorded so there is a gap there's a fair amount of um, slippage in the data set yeah because i know somebody who got bitten in our neighborhood recently they just got the vaccine from basically the pharmacy and the pharmacist gave it so there was not even a hospital involved correct correct so that's you know throughout most of urban india that will be the case most generally well to do people will just you know go to either a private clinic or or like you said just go to a pharmacist if they know what to do then they'll do that but in most cases you know in, in rural areas people either ignore it which is really dangerous or they'll go to their public health their primary health center and if they do go there then it gets recorded Uh, if they fail to do that then that those statistics are lost are lost to to the record and there's no way to even estimate what percentage of the ones that do get recorded are from owned dogs versus strays or street dogs is there you know the forms that recorded do ask those questions like which dog bit you but there's an ambiguity there and the ambiguity is that people you know the way it's recorded in or the questionnaires that are asked in by the medical things is that if they'll ask you if it's an old dog or if it's a stray dog in many cases unlike in cities a lot of own dogs are also free ranging or people might be associated with them very loosely they might feed them and so on and so forth so what we see as stray dogs on streets where they're not properly owned may not always be the case in in villages and we know that most of the problem like most of the dog bite problem actually occurs in villages it makes all the headlines when it happens in cities but more than 90% of dog bite cases happen in rural areas and that's where the greatest urgency is required in addressing this problem that's interesting because as you say of the media coverage we think of this as you know cities overrun by dogs but uh, do we have an estimate of the current number of street dogs in india yeah we estimate that there's between uh, 60 to 80 million dogs in india 
And these are based on sort of broad guesstimates, I would say, because we derive them from human dog ratios. So this is how we basically try and come up with a number that matches human population. As we know, the method for dog control in India has largely failed. And in fact, I would call it a spectacular failure. So when we say 60 to 80 million right now, give us a sense of how it's increased. Like, do we know what it was like 10 years ago, for example? Um, yeah, in 2014, there was an estimate that it was about 60 million by a renowned wildlife ecologist, uh, Professor Matt Comper, who also happened to be my PhD supervisor. He published a book where he did a very detailed analysis of, of human-dog ratios across the world. And then there are other estimates that have also come up with similar numbers. So that was in 2014. My estimate is that in those intervening 10 years, the human population has also gone up from around a billion to now 1.4 billion. So you would expect a concomitant increase in dog populations because ultimately dogs are very closely tied to human. Wherever humans expand, that's where that's where dogs go as well. Now, when someone gets mauled, everyone is in a tizzy. What are some of the other consequences of 60 to 80 million dogs on the streets that we don't think about? Um, there's a whole series of issues that comes up. The number one problem, of course, uh, for human health is uh, rabies. India continues to be the sort of epicenter of the global rabies problem. You know, the old numbers pitched it at about 20,000 human rabies deaths a year based on both uh, surveys as well as the statistical extrapolation. The new numbers are yet to be released, but we expect that number to come down substantially to maybe between 10 to 12,000. Again, I'm just basing this on conversations that I've had with the people who've done those surveys. But the primary reason for this reduction in rabies cases is due to better availability of post-exposure prophylaxis. That means vaccines, basically. And better education, better awareness of the problem. So more people are now getting vaccinated. So that's probably the primary cause of reduction in rabies numbers. It's got nothing to do with success of vaccination programs or success of the ABC. No matter what people tout, we have no evidence of this, except in you know, a very small one or two states here and there, which have managed to achieve some limited success in vaccinating dogs. But other than that, India-wide, it's mostly due to the better availability of vaccines. And beyond rabies, what are the consequences? Yeah, so after rabies, then we have a whole host of helmet parasites, so basically uh, endoparasites, worms, you know, parasitic worms. So think of it, if you have 80 million dogs, then you have thousands of tons of dog feces and urine contaminating our streets. And, you know, these dogs, they're not given any anti-worm medicine or they basically receive no health care. So there's a lot of parasites that are there. These parasites can then contaminate our food, contaminate our water and get into our, our systems. So that's one main cause of worry. So that's from the human health side. Dogs are also known to be the second biggest cause of road accidents in India. This is by a study from the insurance regulator who did this and found that obviously the humans are the number one cause, but free-ranging animals are the second biggest cause. And amongst free-ranging animals, dogs are the number one cause of road accidents. And that's, and as you, of course, as you know, India is ranks very high on road accidents and mortality. And it causes hundreds or thousands of crores of, of economic loss. The third important thing, and other than the direct injuries to humans, is that dogs also have a, a huge impact on, on biodiversity, on wildlife. And this has been a focus of my studies for you know almost uh, 20 years now. And we found widespread evidence that dogs are really important causes of biodiversity loss. I mean, you know, we're already in a biodiversity crisis in this country. Uh, human impacts are seen everywhere. We don't need to be adding another factor. So that's the problem. Finally, and I think this is really important, and, and people who really care about dogs need to hear this. Because as a person who cares about dogs myself, I have dogs. You know, again, they're adopted from the streets. That being on the streets is poor welfare for the dogs themselves. They don't lead very good lives. You know, there's 80% pup mortality within the first year. Dogs routinely suffer horribly from accidents. They suffer from cruelty at the hands of people. They get diseases, they're not fed properly. Most dogs you'll see are, are malnourished, or undernourished. So it's not a good life for them to be on the streets. So, you know, given all of these factors, you can see that having dogs on the streets is not good practice. It's not good law. 
is not a good policy. And when you talk about it affecting wildlife and biodiversity, in, in uh, can you give some examples? So we've done studies now both in India as well as globally, and we find that dogs are the third most important invasive species in natural areas across the world. In India, we found that dogs impact, I mean, at least what we recorded, a minimum of about 80 species of wildlife were directly impacted or killed by dogs, many of which were endangered or even critically endangered. In fact, uh, recently there was an attack by a dog on a great Indian bustard in Rajasthan. And as many of us know, great Indian bustards are one of the most critically endangered birds on earth. You know, we estimate less than 100 or 120 birds left. And we know that dogs also impact nests of birds. There's lots of videos of dogs and photographs of dogs attacking wildlife within wildlife sanctuaries. There's a, a videos of dogs even chasing leopards and wolves. We recently published a paper where we showed that dogs also hybridize with wolves. So that can negatively impact our wolf population in India. So there's a widespread impact of dogs, including passing on diseases to carnivores. Things like canine distemper virus. Again, we published papers that showed that dogs really have negative impacts on the mesocarnivore community in many areas. And in fact, in gear, even lions were found contracted uh, canine distemper virus, potentially from dogs. But people would say, are there no advantages to having street dogs while we understand their lives on the streets are not very good? But I, I mean, well, and the stories of dogs attacking people are horrific. There are also people who feel safer at night with dogs. People say there are less burglaries in my neighborhood. And I mean, let's face it, dogs get a lot of attention because they're cute, they're friendly, they come wagging their tail, and there's a psychological connection that people have. And, and I would have to say that for me, the dogs on my street certainly helped me get through the lockdown and that isolation at that time. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting perspective to have about the benefits of having dogs on the streets. And I believe that comes from a very selfish motive. It doesn't come from anything for the benefit of the dog itself. It comes from us wanting free guard service on the streets. Okay, so we don't want to take the responsibility for keeping our own dogs in our own homes. We want free service on the streets, you know, dogs will bark at night and alert us to the presence of strangers. Now, let's examine this a little bit. What does this mean? It means that as a citizen, my free movement on the street is curtailed because of the presence of dogs that the state does not take responsibility for. On the flip side of it, I'm just a passerby. I'm traveling at night. I'm doing my job. Not just me. Lots of people whose service starts at night, you know, are economic workers, people who do deliveries at night on cycles, on motorcycles, they are the ones who get negatively impacted. So for a very minor service by some urban elite, you expect large sections of the public to suffer. For your service, they are having a great disservice done to them. In terms of companionship, you know, if you really love dogs, please keep dogs at home. That's really all it is. Because it's selfish of you to think that, you know, you will obtain something, you throw a few rotis on the street or you will throw some rice on the street. And that's an equal relationship. It's not. Okay, because you're beyond that, most people do not do anything. There are very few, very, very few people, and it's a fleetingly small minority who go the extra distance to, you know, vaccinate the dog, sterilize them, take them to a hospital if something happens, actually care for them. But even that, from my opinion, doesn't come from a fully altruistic uh, sense. There's a lot of strings attached with that. So I don't buy this argument at all. I think it's just lazy. Uh, it's more, it's basically freeloading on the dogs themselves. There are people in my neighborhood who, in fact, do a lot of these things, which is they have a feeding area at their home for the dogs of the neighborhood. They do take them to hospital vaccination and all of that. But when you bring up feeding, you know, throwing roti and or uh, rice on the streets, when a dog bite that does happen, like the one in Tughlaq Lane in Delhi that was recently, a case was registered for death by negligence against the woman who used to feed the dogs. Is that justified? Are the dog feeders part of the problem in your view? Yeah, it's absolutely justified in, in my opinion, because what feeders do actually is very responsible. All the benefits that you sort of spoke about are privatized to themselves and maybe a little bit to the dogs, but all the dangers are then socialized, are like public. And so then you take no responsibility for that. 
like you said, you know, if the dog bites somebody, it's not my problem. If your dog, if you have a dog on a leash, any dog owner in this country, and we've had a whole series of this happening, you know, people whose dogs, there's a whole bunch of videos that came, people's dogs attack, you know, neighbor's child in a lift or attack somebody in a playground. That dog owner is liable for this, okay, because it's that person's dog. For example, recently, I think it was Tavleen Singh who said, refused to pay a fine because her dog littered on the street and she didn't pick it up saying that, you know, why should I pay it when there are thousands of dogs on the streets that are defecating there and nobody's being held responsible for it. This is the same case. The feeder, her responsibility ended by feeding the dog. She takes no further responsibility for the dog's actions on the street. And that has to, so I'm very, very glad that a criminal case has been registered because this will force people who feed dogs to actually start, you know, or force the state to hold them accountable. Because right now there's zero accountability from the people who feed dogs in the streets. But Abhi, so if this case causes someone to say, okay, I won't feed the dog anymore, I won't feed dogs anymore, how does it help anyone? And because some people would say dogs will bite more if they're hungry and not fed. And the other side, people would say, in this really horrible world out there, somebody is showing compassion for whatever reason. And you are trying to criminalize compassion. Yeah, I'm not criminalizing compassion. I'm actually challenging their version of compassion. In fact, I'm saying that this is not compassion. This is the opposite of it. If you wanted to be really compassionate, you take full responsibility. Okay, after all, dogs are companion animals. They are supposed to be our best friends. A lot of people treat dogs like they do their own children. Okay, you do not leave your children unattended on the street. Correct. This is the same argument that these people are saying against those poor people whose child was mauled. In fact, there are cases where the dogs have gone inside the house and and lifted the child. And yet every time these, the same group of people will always blame, say, how can you leave a child unattended? Well, I can throw the same question back at you. How can you leave street dogs unattended on the street? Okay, so it's not compassion. Real compassion would involve forcing the state to take more responsibility and saying, build good quality shelters. Let's put these dogs in good quality shelters. Let's make sure that they have a good life there. If you don't think that you can see dogs in the shelters, please adopt them. We are 1.4 billion people in this country. Yeah, but that's easier said than done. I mean, both you and I know, I mean, you said you have dogs adopted from the street. We have a dog that was puppy whose siblings died in car accidents and the surviving sibling was adopted. But much as you or I would like, we cannot adopt 50 dogs, right? And so there are so many dogs out there. We don't need to adopt 50 dogs. I mean, the woman who on our street who does feed the dogs, she has two that she's full time adopted. There are three that basically live in the house, but sort of come and go. And she feeds. But I mean, you know, she wants to help these dogs. She's vaccinating them. She's doing all of that. But she can't physically accommodate 15 dogs in her house but she's still feeding them. And I feel like it's very harsh of me to say that you can only keep the four you can accommodate in your house. No, no, I agree. So look, the thing is, no, we are stuck in this vicious loop now. Nobody wants to go and kill dogs. Every time I talk about this, everybody says, oh, you're, you want to cull all dogs. I'm saying, look, there are humane methods that you can use. There are some hard decisions we do need to take. Okay, let's talk about what we should be able to do. And let's talk about this from the city's perspective and then we go to the village's perspective because there are two very separate problems here. Most of the attention gets focused only on cities mm. because most animal rights activists are come from, you know, very urban, very elite circumstances. Let's say I put a moratorium. Okay, I said, okay, you, you're feeding these two or three dogs on the streets now. Give an undertaking that you will not feed any more after this. That if a third dog shows up there, you will not feed them. If these two dogs get involved in an accident and the person who's suffering from that accident, you know, files a case against you, then you're criminally liable. You're responsible for that. If these dogs bite somebody or if something happens to the dogs, the same laws that apply to animal owners should apply to you. That's not asking for too much. If you say, I can't do this, let the state take response. Let the municipal bodies take responsibility for this. Okay. Then you're bringing parity. And what do I mean by parity? We also have rules and regulations for other free roaming animals on the streets. For example, cows, pigs, or stray cattle problem that we have. We don't recommend having lots of stray cattle on the streets, correct? 
we say that oh we should build goshawas for them so this is no different i don't see a law that recommends that cattle should live on the street so even amongst animals we have a disparity in what kinds of laws we've got i don't think this is compassion i think this is a conditioning that has really warped our relationship with dogs and this has come about only in the last 20 30 years although the problem of street dogs goes back a long time i mean even in the 1800s there was there were riots in bombay because of stray dogs it's an old story but i think this you know we shouldn't couch it as compassion versus animal welfare versus human rights or animal rights versus human rights etc we should say what call it what it is and that's it's elitism basically so very small group of people dictating to india to the rest of india what they consider to be good for animals when in fact it's universally accepted that this is not good no other country in the world has these kinds of laws that that require dogs to live indefinitely on the streets most of them require that dogs be put in shelters or be adopted and many places have rules that if they are not adopted within a certain period of time then they be humanely euthanized there are no kill shelters as well there are people who say i don't want to see any animal killed well please go and donate to those shelters go and feed them in those shelters or let the state give land for setting them up in fact this is what the bombay high court has recently asked the city of nagpur to do and by the way the your the neighbor that you're talking about is a small minority we have done surveys in bangalore and other cities and we find that most people only feed dogs they don't do the rest of it they expect the municipality to come and catch the dogs and, and sterilize them or worse when the dog the municipality does come to stay catch dogs they will hide them they will prevent the municipal workers from doing their job so in most cases this is a problem that has been created by us okay it's not the dog's fault but it's up to us to solve it is it like what i call the panda problem it's that dogs because they're cute and have waggy tails that so much of it is compared to many of these other animals you're talking about there is an emotional bias towards dogs and does that frustrate you no no of course there's an emotional bias i mean you know you know when i see dogs in the street i want to pet them and cuddle them and you know if you see a puppy you want to immediately go and pick it up i mean that's how i got my dogs i saw dogs in the street and you know when one came wagging its tail to me i picked it up and took it home we have this deep bond in fact dogs have evolved to elicit that response from humans you know when they the domestication process itself from wolves led to this dogs have evolved to elicit that reaction from us so obviously we have a deep bond with dogs therefore i find it even more astonishing that we will continue to let millions of dogs suffer on the streets the way they do with policies that are designed to frankly do little but create conflict it's pitching one group of people against another it's become almost cultish this dog with the feeding of dog and it's it comes from sort of deep psychosocial problems as well where people you know sort of develop this strong and it's it's very similar to animal hoarding and animal hoarding is is recognized as a mental health problem in many countries where people are just you know and they feel like they can do good by by keeping lots of animals but this is a manifestation of that but in public places so you would say i mean that the, that according to you there is no responsible way to feed dogs um not in the way it's currently being done so let's look at what's happening in most cities and again i've maintained that there are very 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 few examples of people who do feed responsibly but even they sort of skirt the issue of taking full responsibility first of all the first thing i want to do is stop all this mass feeding of dogs there are people who made it a business to go and feed dogs they collect lots of money on social media and in fact there's been lots of cases of fraudulent collection of money as well they'll go around in vans and you know throw food on the streets everywhere in utter violation of all guidelines that has to completely stop if you feel like you know such as your neighbor does you've got two dogs on the street outside and you take full responsibility for them do it until those dogs die and then you say i will not feed any more dogs that come on the street okay because that is then keeping this problem going in perpetuity people should not be coming from some other neighborhood to feed dogs in your neighborhood so there should be like a geo tag of of sorts and if you are feeding dogs then then those dogs should be identified to those feeders so tomorrow if a dog goes and bites someone attacks someone gets in an accident with someone those dog those feeders can be identified as in the case of this lady who was charged with negligence because ultimately it's their responsibility so there are very narrow conditions where this can happen 
and you have to also be responsible for the. We've seen. I mean, you know, I just drive around in my neighborhood here, and I see dogs that have skin conditions, that have wounds in them, and again, I see the feeders come, throw food, and walk away. They're not doing anything else to take care of those dogs. So this kind of nonsense has to stop. The other thing I also want to point out is that in my neighborhood in in Bangalore, when I first moved in there, there was a dog feeder who'd come on a there was an old gentleman who'd come on a scooter and he would throw biscuits and milk on the on the side. And this place had hundreds of dogs. Okay, they would all wait patiently. A few years later, I saw this. You know, maybe something happened to the gentleman that stopped. And then slowly, I noticed the dogs also all disappeared. And that's a combination of the city itself taking responsibility. Vaccinating and neutering them, so lots of puppies were not being born. But then the survival rate of the rest of the population also goes down very quickly if people stop feeding them on the streets. The other thing also that happens, and this is happens in all cities, and which I attribute also to a major reduction in the dog population, is the municipal authorities come, catch them from here, and then go leave them somewhere in some in some village. Isn't that illegal now? That is illegal, but it still happens. It it happens very regularly. That's the only thing that explains a sudden reduction in dogs in in an area. And people attribute it to oh, ABC works and so on. ABC doesn't work. Our modeling studies show it doesn't work. ABC we should mention is animal birth control rule. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, animal birth control, which is the main rule, the law, where basically you catch a dog, sterilize it, vaccinate it, leave it back on the street. Now, Pune city, when we were doing the study, had massive rates of rabies in dogs. Okay, we recorded something about seven hundred cases of rabies. Over a four-year period, and this I suspect is common across India. Wherever you start looking, you will find it. But the activists allege that, oh no, no, we have been vaccinating dogs for ten years. Well, if you have, then you shouldn't have had seven hundred cases of rabies in Pune city. Our models show, and global studies show, that you have to vaccinate seventy percent of the dog population annually to then see a reduction in rabies over time. Many people also conflate this with the sterilization procedure. You know, sterilization has to be more than 90% of the dog population over a short period of time, and then you will see a 70% reduction over a 10 to 15 year period. You won't see it happening in a three or four year period. In fact, I read this one statistic, and I wanted to run it by you. But someone said when we talked about neutering that uh, one unaltered dog, a neutered dog. And her offspring in six years can produce up to sixty-seven thousand puppies. Is that? Yes, that's rubbish. That's biologically impossible. But that's what I was wondering. Basically, what they've done is they've assumed a hundred percent survival rate in all the puppies, and they've assumed longevity of the dog itself. Whereas data from the streets of India shows that there's about eighty percent mortality of dogs in the first year, and the average lifespan of a dog is about three to four years. So this is all statistically trickery, basically. Before we leave the city, one of the thing I wanted to ask you was: Would garbage management affect dog population? Um, to a certain extent. See, in, in cities, again, uh, you know, places like Bangalore, we found that garbage is only a secondary source of food for dogs. We found that people feeding dogs is the primary source. Okay, and dog populations were highest where people were feeding them. So that's one thing. Villages is a slightly different. Issue there, we found that actually most dogs, about seventy percent of the dog population, they would be owned by villages, and by owned again, they're free ranging, but they're associated with households, and people give names to them. They'll you know they'll have they'll say yeah that's my dog. So again, there's no medical intervention for them. If there's a batch of puppies that they don't want, they'll put it in a sack and go and leave it by the roadside next to a highway, and then suddenly you'll see a bunch of puppies in the highway, most of which will end up dead within a short period of time. So yeah, garbage is certainly. A, a causation, a, a contributing factor, and in some places where you have large open garbage dumps, then certainly you will see high number of dog populations around them. So controlling access to garbage is also important. And so you know, as our cities get cleaner, we should start seeing concomitant decrease in dog population in those areas. And we are seeing it in some places. Like for example, you know, we did a survey in Baramati city. In Baramati, there are barely any dogs in the streets because it's a very clean city. I suspect Indore might have the same thing happening there, unless there are people feeding dogs in the street. I see people feeding cats as well on the streets. There's somebody going around, and um, cats or monkeys are feeding monkeys. Is it the same problem, or just the scale is different because of the number of dogs? It's the same problem. It's absolutely the same problem. And the thing is, look, feeding cats is also bad for biodiversity. We know that cats. Are the cause for massive mortality in bird populations across the globe. So that's going to be an issue. 
monkeys, if you're not allowed to feed wildlife, it's a crime under the Wildlife Protection Act. And you know, once you start feeding monkeys, they get habituated to feeding, then they start coming into houses, and then you have this whole other issue. Pigeons, people love feeding pigeons. And pigeons have been likened to basically flying rats. Okay, the amount of diseases that they can carry and that they can cause. They can cause massive fouling problems as well. Everybody who lives in a high-rise apartment knows this. The Supreme Court, in fact, uh, passed an order saying that you're not even allowed to feed pigeons from your own balcony if it's causing nuisance to your neighbors. So I have a very simple rule of thumb on this. If you're not directly responsible for the care of that animal, you have no business going out and feeding animals in public. You know, it's not punya, it's not karma, it's none of those things because it's very selective what you're feeding. Okay, you're not feeding rats. What you're also doing is you're ignoring the cost of the food production of the food that you're feeding to these animals. Now, agriculture is the leading cause of biodiversity loss in the world. We are growing food for our consumption because we have decided that we are important to ourselves. That food that we grow, that therefore we have to grow food. Otherwise, we can't feed ourselves. And that's a baseline assumption. We need it. But then some people have decided that they'll take some of this food and go and feed it to animals. Some animals. Now, if you really care about animals, you would also worry about the animals that you killed or whose habitat you destroyed while that food was being grown. And this is not a small amount. A study estimated that something like 30% additional land is being used for growing food that we feed to animals, our pets, not to livestock. You're basically robbing Paul to Peter types. You know, you're somebody suffering always. So you're not, your net punya is zero in this case, might actually even be negative. I would revisit that concept. Let me talk about the policy. So as far as I know that there was a Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act that dated back to 1960. That was the basis of how city, how we dealt with stray animals like stray dogs. That got replaced by an, the for ABC, Animal Birth Control Rules, in 2001. No, that's incorrect. So the ABC rules are rules under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. Okay. They derive, so they are, you know, rules can't replace an act. So rules are subsidiary to the act, but they're framed under the act. So under the act itself, the act states, allows for, the, it uses the word, you know, it says destruction of stray dogs. So it allows for euthanasia or killing of dogs. Uh, but what the ABC policy did then is it took away those powers, illegally so, because rules cannot overturn a law. So that's what's being challenged in the Supreme Court at the moment. And ABC 2001 and then subsequently the new ABC 2023 rules that were brought in to replace the ABC 2001 rules and only made the rules worse because they fixed some of the loopholes that were there in the 2001 rules which the animal rights activists were, you know, they were seeing that this was a problem and stuff in fact that we had raised including where dogs are, the definition of what's where a dog lives. So it included things like private residences, gated communities, all of those things, residence welfare associations, all of those things got included as well in the, into the territory of a dog or what they call community dog. So then that became problematic. But yeah, basically the rules were formed under the law and uh, the rules said that if the local authority was desirous of reducing, this is the 2001 rules of reducing the dog population, then they would capture them, sterilize them, vaccinate them and return them to the place they got them. You said they fixed some loopholes in 2023. So did it change the way the power that was invested in the local authority to do all these things to control the dog population? No, no, it, it made things worse for residents of welfare, like, you know, of private gated communities and so on, because they could now no longer prevent people from outside coming and feeding dogs. They could not ask for dogs to be removed from their private compounds. Okay, because, you know, ultimately a gated community is a private compound. Lots of educational institutions in the country have a huge dog problem as well. IITs, IISC and so on. In fact, the Madras High Court ruled that IIT was not a dog compound. They should not be free-ranging dogs in IIT Madras and ruled that those dogs should be removed because they were killing the wildlife in IIT Madras. So all those actions were there, they were taken. The problem, of course, is that, you know, once you have a group of people who are hell-bent on doing, on creating the conflict, only having their single narrow-minded vision of what constitutes animal welfare imposed on a society at large. And these are people, they are powerful people. They are powerful ministers and powerful politicians with a lot of backing. So, you know, and they're 
the scene as messiahs of animal welfare. And nobody in India, and also lots of celebrities in India, lots of Bollywood celebrities are always looking to be pro stray dog. And I want to question them, like, you know, look at yourselves, look at where you are in society, and then look at the cases where children are being mauled to death. I have never seen a single candlelight march for children by all of these celebrities. And according to the ABC, is a street dog its own legal entity now? Yes, it is. The ABC rules have defined dogs to belong on streets. Basically, they've said dogs are either pet dogs or they're street dogs or they're community dogs. Okay, they could, in fact, this 2023 rules created this new category called community dogs, which did not exist before. And it's very loose. What is a community? Who defines what the community is? It says the community where a dog is born into. What does it mean? There's no, these are really loose terms. They have no legal meaning. So we are hoping that, you know, the Supreme Court can step in, can intervene and can, you know, quash these nonsense rules and throw them out. But how do you respond, though, then when people say that, you know, these are not stray dogs. I mean, these are street dogs because they were born on the street. Their home is on the street. It's not like they're lost and abandoned on the street. Their home is on the street. And uh, the fact that, well, in some cases, you could say somebody once told me that, the dog was probably there even before the street was. Sure, no no problem. None of those. If that is indeed the case, then let's categorize them as wildlife and let the Wildlife Protection Act apply to them. And uh, under the Wildlife Protection Act, if any animal is found to cause harm to humans, it can be removed from that area. It can be killed. Tigers are not exempt. Remember, this is our national animal. Schedule one species. Elephants can be killed, leopards can be killed, any any of our top or most charismatic species can be killed. If a snake is found, it's immediately caught and rescued and released somewhere else, even though it, that's where its home is. Why this special treatment for dogs? Why have you put the lives of dogs or the rights of dogs to live on streets above the rights of all other animals and indeed above the rights of humans? In India, and India is the only country in the world to do this, you're not even allowed to euthanize a rabid dog. So... Some a rabid dog in our neighborhood did get euthanized recently. So I was wondering how that happened. If that happened, it's against the law, as per the ABC rules. So what are you supposed to do with a rabid dog as per the ABC? ABC rules are probably the most cruel animal welfare rules in the world because, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing from them, it says they should be allowed to die a natural death. Now, anybody who has seen a rabid dog knows there's nothing nice about dying from rabies. The, the kindest thing that you can do to a dog that's that's even suspected of having rabies, okay? Because if it's being suspected of having rabies, there's something very seriously wrong with it. You should euthanize it because you can euthanize them for other diseases, but not for rabies. And so this is very twisted in my mind, you know? I'm not asking you to put on the hat of the animal rights activist here, but what was the logic, purported logic behind that? I'm baffled. I have no idea what the logic was. I'm presumably... They could be afraid that, you know, if under this law, they could categorize any biting dog as rabid and say, oh, that has become rabid and you should euthanize it. But actually, there's a condition there. The rules themselves state that it has to be examined by a veterinarian and a representative of the Animal Welfare Authority or the Animal Welfare Organization. And they have to then certify that this like dog is most likely rabid and they have to keep it in isolation. Now, the veterinarians themselves are loath to do this. The veterinarians themselves, you know, because they also, they, you know, after all, people go into veterinary practice because they like animals. They know how this animal suffers. Most veterinarians, good, you know, well-thinking, well-meaning veterinarians will, will quietly go and will say, oh, this dog suffers from CDV and go and euthanize it. So if I have a chronic biter in my neighborhood, not rabies as far as we know, just a chronic biter, what are my options as per this act? Um, Very little. So as per this, what they say is that if an, a dog is found to be biting, um, then it has to be taken into observation by an animal welfare organization, put in a shelter for 10 days and observed. Then it says treated, that alpha tendencies have to be, I mean, I don't know what this is. This is all rubbish. It's not based on any form of, you know, dog behavior or any scientific basis. Uh, it's just vague nonsense they put in there. And then it will be released back to where you found it, you know, 10 days later. Now you tell me something. If a dog is territorial, if it's found to chase vehicles, you catch it and you put it into captivity, okay? And it's sitting there, poor thing in this environment that it doesn't know, it's going to be fearful. It's not going to come aggressively barking at you and, and you know, attacking you. 
it most dogs will be fearful because they are in a strange environment and they are probably in this cell with some other dogs. They are highly stressed. They are unlikely to show the same aggressive behavior. So what these people will do is, oh no, this dog showed no aggressive behavior. Typically when do dogs show aggressive behavior? They show it to strangers. They show it to people who display a certain body language. You know, they show it to children, people who are afraid, people who are running away from them. If you have somebody who knows how to handle a dog, who knows how to understand dog body language, you exude confidence, you exude dominance over the dog. The dog is not going to come charging and biting you. If you are an animal welfare organization, presumably you have people who know how to handle dogs. Obviously, those dogs are not going to come and uh, show these you know, aggressive tendencies to those people because these people know how to handle dogs. You're not a little child who's running away from a dog. Since you mentioned dogs about dogs being territorial, it made me think in that case, especially for an adult dogs, I'm not talking about little puppies, uh, even shelters work because it's not their territory anymore if their territory was a free-ranging street. Uh, no, they work. They work for many reasons. We know that territoriality also breaks down when there's a steady supply of, of food. You know, when there's a predictable source of food. And that's what you will see in many places. You'll see all these people congregating dogs in one place. You don't see scuffles and fights between those dogs. They all come together very happily and they'll all leave after that. Okay, because that central place that they found a place to eat in, they're all they're happy there. Then they're also then they start defending those areas. Some people go and feed 200 dogs. You'll see that happening. You know, there's a famous lady in, in Delhi, in fact, who was an old lady, homeless apparently, who'd go and feed 200 dogs. There are people everywhere who, you know, feed hundreds of dogs. They go out, go out at night. You don't see massive territory fights. You'll usually see them in, in streets where people feed two or three dogs and there's another street next to that where people will feed another two two three dogs. And then those dogs, when they come together at some meeting area, will, will bark and fight at Bark and fight. If you found a single space to feed all those dogs, they all come together very happily and feed there. So, you know, shelters work everywhere else in the world. We are not asking for some, there's no rocket science here. You know, people keep shelters. There are people who have private sanctuaries for dogs. You know, there's a guy, um, what's his guy? He's called the Voice of Stray Dogs or something like that. There's a, he has a sanctuary. There are people who keep 500, 600 dogs in open areas. So, in your opinion, do you think that? a sterilization program can work ultimately. You said we have to sterilize what, 80, 90% of the dogs in a short period for us to see. Is that realistic or is the unpleasant truth that for you that um, sort of mass euthanasia kind of things are the only way to deal with this? Okay, so here's the thing. It's, you know, the ABC policy is, is flawed. Uh, it's scientifically flawed. flawed. We've shown it to, to be so. It can't work. It's an unworkable policy. Okay, those rules are just rubbish, basically. It's based on a very flawed assumption and flawed understanding of dog population dynamics. Let's take Bangalore City, for instance. It's got a population of about maybe four lakh dogs, four to five lakh dogs. It could be seven, it could be eight. You know, we need to estimate properly. But let's say it's got four lakh dogs. That means you need to sterilize, you know, about three and a half lakh dogs in the first year itself. At the maximum, that you know the local authorities are able to sterilize is about 50, 60,000, maybe 70,000 dogs in a year. And so what does that happen? That means that you know next year you go, you're again dealing with a slightly higher population, a slightly higher population. Then over time, the ones that you sterilize have died. The other thing is this, is that we're not living on islands. There's always, the cities are growing, the municipal authorities are not targeting those new areas now. There's always immigration happening from neighboring areas. So, colleagues just said, this is like trying to mop the floor while the tap is running. You need to turn off the tap first. You can't do anything otherwise. And so, for me, the tap is really controlling resources. If you control the supply of food on the streets, and studies have shown this, it will result in a quick and drastic reduction in the number of dogs. And no hungry dogs don't go around biting people because they're too busy looking for food. Okay, so two things can happen. One, they'll disperse out of the area because if you don't have food in an area, you'll go looking for food somewhere else. So then they'll probably start congregating in an area where there's more food, which may be a garbage dump or something like that. There's no reason for a dog to sit in one place and starve to death. So if the sterilization numbers are so daunting, you know, I read somewhere that I think Mexico eliminated rabies. And it's of an entirely different scale size-wise. But are there lessons there that we can draw or is it this, should we not draw any parallels with a country like Mexico? 
No, we shouldn't try and draw parallels, mainly because the scale of the problem is so vastly different. And I mean vastly, orders of magnitude different. The number of dogs that are found in some of these cities or in some of these countries are a minuscule proportion of the number of dogs that we find here. <laughs> Think of the, you know, how do you catch? So it's just Bangalore again. How do you catch three and a half lakh dogs? Think of the manpower or human power required to catch that many, that many dogs. Not all the dogs are easily catchable. Many of them are going to run away this, the moment they see some, you know, dog catching van show up. Yeah, and they seem very aware of which van is a dog catching van. Absolutely. I mean, look, the dogs are clever. You know, dogs are very clever animals. They're not stupid by any means. So, you know, you're going to see that happening, of course. So, yeah, so, you know, the idea that you can sterilize your way out of this problem is just is ridiculous. It hasn't, doesn't even work in very controlled population. Let's take the examples of Jaipur and Jodhpur that these people keep talking about. You just have to visit there and you know it doesn't work there. And they've been doing it for 25 years. All the famous studies come from there. Goa is another example. They declared Goa to go on to be rabies free. Human rabies free. Okay, not dog rabies free. But dog rabies keeps coming up from time to time. Goa has a unique geography. It's a small state. It's surrounded by the hills. There's rivers. So you can sort of patrol the population. But they themselves acknowledge that uh, dogs come in from Maharashtra on the other side. The other successful example that's given is Sikkim. Again, look at Sikkim's geography. It's a tiny state. It's a Himalayan state. There's, there's controlled movement of dogs up and down. So the cherry picking is very, uh, very apparent there. In Sikkim, if you go to the army areas, the border areas, there are hundreds of dogs there. And they're a massive problem for wildlife in, in those areas. Um, and, you know, so if, if all you're doing is going around vaccinating dogs and you're just creating a, a healthier population of dogs, that are then going to continue to have great more and more impacts on wildlife. You're not going to solve the problem. So finally, I would say, Abhi, since this, uh, the ABC rules are being, uh, you know, the Supreme Court is looking at it, and, uh, well, the dogs don't speak, so they don't get their lawyer in the, in the court. But um, what do you hope can come out of it in terms of reforming the ABC rule, which you feel would be good for i mean is there any place where dog lovers and people who want you know there a scenario where there could be harmonious coexistence between dogs and humans in our cities and villages it should be harmonious they are you know dogs are companion animals it's, it's ridiculous that we've created this problem so the way for it to be is for us to reimagine our relationship with dogs we have to then start giving dogs the attention they deserve, the love that they deserve. And the only that can, the way that can happen is first to strengthen our dog ownership laws, the licensing mechanisms, the responsibility on dog owners, uh, pet parents, whatever you want to call them. That needs to start increasing so that people then take responsibility for, their, for the animals that they keep with them or the animals that they feed, either in villages or in cities. Given the problem that we already have, and this is a very huge problem, uh, the ABC rules need to be scrapped in total. Municipal authorities then need to be put in charge of deciding what they should do with the dogs in there. Because ultimately, they are the, you know, the corporations and municipal authorities are the statutory body for this. You cannot have a central rule governing. Let them decide on a case-to-case -case basis what should be the best way to do. Let them involve the local, um, you know, the people who, who claim to be animal lovers, dog lovers, call them what you want. Let, let them involve them, let them come together consensus, let people who and all stakeholders, not just the animal lovers, but also the people who are affected by this, let them also come together on this and come, you know, put together a proper democratic setup that actually, but also one that safe, ensures the safe safety of humans first and foremost, but also ensures the welfare of the animals that we are taking care of. Look, there are no silver bullet solutions here. This is not easy. But it can be done. It can be done with the right kind of uh, intervention. It's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of money. But the way it's currently being done is not going to solve the problem even in 100 years. Abhiti Vinak, thank you so much for joining uh, us today and talking about this very emotive issue, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Abhiti Vanak is an ecologist and director of the Center for Policy Design at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. We take street dogs for granted in a place like India. They're everywhere. It's only when we travel to other parts of the world do we realize that's not true everywhere. 
Jesse Alk, an American filmmaker who originally came to Kolkata over a decade ago, remembers his first impression of the city. And I remember the first thing I saw was a dog ran across the tarmac. And I thought, I've never seen a dog on an airport tarmac before, you know, what is going on? The dogs and the animals were something that immediately struck me because we don't really have that same thing in the same way in American cities. Jesse ended up making Pariah Dog, a documentary about Kolkata and its street dogs. It opens with a dog howling into the night, something that's just part of the soundscape of a Kolkata night. Trailer, and it's this lone dog howling. It has a very distinctive howl. And um, I got that scene because that that, that was actually shot in front of this house we're sitting in right now. And I was on the roof, and and my my room is on the roof of the building here. And I would hear him howling every night at like 4 a.m., lonesome, lonesome howling. This is oddly a story about being lonesome in a city of millions. I mean, I remember when I, you know, I grew up in a small town and I remember when I moved to California feeling deeply lonely in a city, you know, where I didn't know people. And In Pariah Dog, we meet not just the indigenous dogs who make the streets their home, but a quirky band of dog lovers who feed them, scold them, nurse them and mourn them. One of the dogs that's been sort of semi-adopted uh, dies, and the character uh, is just devastated, just absolutely devastated, and, and is crying on camera. They are also loners in their own ways. One drives a three-wheeler, another is part Russian, part Japanese, part Indian, sort of fading gentry, who imperiously fights for her dogs. <laughs> But they are mostly people without much to spare, like one of the characters Jesse follows. So he gets the food for the dogs from a hotel who gives him the scraps every day at noon, the extra rice, whatever isn't eaten, and he takes it. And he walks miles and miles across the city feeding dogs, feeding dogs, and and a lot of times he'll eat what's left over. And there is a strange bond between the people and the dogs which goes beyond eccentric Good Samaritans feeding hapless dogs. Because when I watch the dogs, uh, they're deeply lonely, you know, because it's not just food that they want. What's unbelievable, and especially because these aren't pets, right, is they have this innate desire to be loved by people. You know, uh, the manger street dog, if you go up to him who's hungry and you don't have food and you pet him, he'll melt. Most of them, obviously not all. But sentimentality is a luxury. Street dogs have a tough life, like when a crippled puppy tries to cross a busy street and then a little boy appears out of nowhere. In the perfect frame, too, you know, he came and took the puppy out of the street and and what did he do? He didn't save it or take it home with him. He just put it back where it was and walked off. You know, temporary solution, but that's, that's actually the situation, right? It's like harm reduction. When Jesse goes back to America, where dogs don't howl on the street and flocks of crows aren't squabbling on the terrace, he misses this daily interaction between man and animal in urban life. These things, you know, I just love, 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 and I miss it like crazy, actually. It it seems, it makes, if I stay for an extended period of time, it makes U.S. cities feel sterile and lifeless to me. That does not change the many problems that an increasing population of dogs on the street, whom no one is responsible for, pose for all of us. And yet the dogs are there. Some call them street dogs, some call them stray. I like to to say they were, the the street dogs were here before the streets were here. You know, they've they've been here and um, native Indian dogs. There is no easy answer to this dilemma. But during COVID, when the streets emptied of traffic and the dogs took over, I did start looking at them differently. When one ran up to me on the street, I would stop and pat them, sometimes offer a biscuit. Often I would have thought I was giving them something. 
now I realize I was also seeking something from them. A reassurance of a familiar world where everything had not been irrevocably changed by a virus and we could still touch one another. Let us know what you think about this show. Wherever you get your podcast from, find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Express Podcasts. Thanks as always for listening. This show was produced by Shashank Bhargav and edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. This is Sandeep Roy on Express Audio. <laughs>